Hey squad, welcome back, and if you're new here, welcome to the channel. Today I'm attempting to make a meaningful comparison between the fictional universes of J.R.R. Tolkien and H.P. Lovecraft, two authors who, at first glance, might seem to have little in common. There is no shortage of terrifying creatures in Middle-earth, and as often as Tolkien's writing is associated with hope and heroism, it can just as easily evoke disgust and dread. But it's the suggestion of unknowable, impossibly old horrors that most often prompts comparison to the eldritch abominations that populate Lovecraft's stories and novellas. Lovecraft's fiction uses terrible, incomprehensible entities from the far reaches of space to emphasize the futility of human knowledge. His Elder Things and Old Ones are portrayed as indifferent not only to humanity itself, but even to concepts like good and evil. Tolkien's work is known for its strong sense of morality, so when even he hints that some of Middle-earth's creatures are as alien and hostile to the powers of evil as they are to the forces of good, the comparison to Lovecraft's work naturally arises. In one passage often cited in such cases, Gandalf reports that far, far below the deepest delvings of the dwarves, the world is gnawed by nameless things, even Sauron knows them not, they are older than he. Now I have walked there, but I will bring no report to darken the light of day." Other so-called Lovecraftian entities include Ungoliant, her monstrous spawn the Great Spiders, the Old Forest with its ancient sinister animated trees, and the tentacled Watcher in the Water. As suggestive as such passages are, though, those familiar with these two writers tend to be dubious about efforts to connect them, and there are some very good reasons for that. First are the differences in style, form, and genre. Apart from a handful of poetry collections and fairy tales, during his lifetime Tolkien was mainly known for his magnum opus The Lord of the Rings, a thousand-page book that defined modern high fantasy. Lovecraft, on the other hand, wrote dozens of shorter pieces for pulp magazines mainly in the style known as weird fiction, which contains elements of science fiction and horror. Secondly, although the two were contemporaries, there's little evidence that either was familiar with the other's work. Lovecraft died in 1937, before the publication of The Hobbit, and well before Tolkien even started working on its sequel. At the time of his death, little of his work was widely available outside the United States. There is evidence that in the 60s, Tolkien read and reviewed a volume of short stories that included one by Lovecraft, but Tolkien makes no particular mention of this piece, and even this possible exposure would have come toward the tail end of Tolkien's life and writing career. Finally, while each produced fiction that reflected their personal philosophies, those philosophies were wildly different. Lovecraft believed the universe was purely mechanistic and rejected any effort to comprehend it or assign meaning to existence. Despite his pessimism about mankind's destructive tendencies, Tolkien believed in divine order and the hope of mercy and redemption. But while it's safe to say the two writers were not a direct influence on each other, in the past few years several critics have made a good case for evaluating the similarities and differences between Tolkien and Lovecraft in more depth. After all, if nothing else, the two have had tremendous influence on pop culture. Tolkien is widely regarded as the father of modern fantasy. Lovecraft's influence may be less direct and less obvious, but it is pervasive. His fiction gave rise to the so-called Cthulhu mythos, which many authors continued to collaborate on after his death, but beyond work explicitly set in his universe, he's been cited as an influence by some of the 20th century's most successful artists, writers, and filmmakers. Born just two years apart, the two men share several biographical similarities, including the early loss of their fathers, a degree of financial scarcity in their youths, and a passion for academic disciplines that would inform their creative work. They also seem to have enjoyed similar kinds of literature, and moreover were both familiar with several specific works, including ancient Greek and Norse myths, and the work of British fantasist Lord Dunsany. Both men also drew inspiration from the regions and landscapes they'd lived in during their early lives. New England, and particularly Providence, Rhode Island for Lovecraft, and the West Midlands and the village of Serhole for Tolkien. Both approached their writing very seriously. Indeed, each man produced a manifesto defining and defending the importance of their approach to fiction. As suggestive as all these similarities are, they could still be no more than coincidences, but this becomes less likely when we start to notice just how many of Tolkien's most characteristic devices and themes also appear in Lovecraft's fiction. Tolkien and Lovecraft both populated their worlds with a range of inhuman creatures and intelligences, including a hierarchy of godlike beings whose origins lie outside the bounds of Earth itself. They often evoke a sense of these beings' alien natures by describing them as indescribable. 
This accounts for the references to nameless things, yes, but also cases in which, though the identity of the thing is known, the characters find themselves at a loss for words. Of Sam's first encounter with the elves, Tolkien writes, Sam could never describe in words nor picture clearly to himself what he felt or thought that night, though it remained in his memory as one of the chief events of his life. In a more sinister case, Pippin's attempts to describe what he saw in the Palantir often leave him speechless. Then the stars went in and out, they were cut off by things with wings. One began to fly straight toward me, getting bigger and bigger, it had a horrible… no, no, I can't say. Representations of words and names in fictional, inhuman languages are another important tool both authors use to evoke this atmosphere of strangeness. We could consider Aya Er Indil Elenion Ankalima, the Tolkienian counterpart to <gasps> Another key component to each author's desired atmosphere is the suggestion of vast expanses of both space and time. They both like to use the ruined remains of ancient civilizations as settings with a particular awareness of further realms and ruins hidden by the sea. Whether it be sunken Beleriand and Numenor, or the nightmare corpse city of Rulye, and other unnamed realms of Cyclopean masonry. Some of the best-known works of both authors feature bright, curious protagonists who come into contact with progressively more otherworldly and unnerving beings, revealing unguessed truths about reality that had lain just below the surface of the ordinary world they had known before. The premise of The Call of Cthulhu and The Lord of the Rings has a protagonist inheriting a mysterious artifact from an older relative who's died or disappeared under mysterious circumstances. At first, the relic seems innocuous, but gradually both protagonists learn that it is intimately connected with an ancient resurgent evil. Fully understanding the nature of what they've gotten involved with renders both incapable of taking pleasure in the ordinary world. As the narrator of The Call of Cthulhu remarks, I have looked upon all that the universe has to hold of horror, and even the skies of spring and the flowers of summer must ever afterward be poison to me. But I do not think my life will be long." A sentiment shared by many of Lovecraft's protagonists and several of Tolkien's. Through tactics like creating frame narratives, invoking translation, and highlighting their narrator's limited, untrustworthy, or corrupted perceptions, both authors blur the line between reality, history, and fiction, which enhances the verisimilitude of their outlandish stories, but also calls into question the reliability of narrative itself. They even go so far as to create fictional sources that are given fabricated histories of their own. The Necronomicon of Abdul Alhazred in Lovecraft's work and the Red Book of Westmarch in Middle-earth. These commonalities, both artistic and biographical, may not be the products of random chance after all. Many of the overlapping elements in the work of Tolkien and Lovecraft can be attributed to the similarities of their upbringing and their shared literary influences, but it's also likely that both writers employed these techniques to depict a shared concern, the rapid approach of what we now call the modern world. Though inspired by the distant past, Tolkien and Lovecraft were both keenly aware of the events and preoccupations of their own time. In her article, The New Shoggoth Sheik, Amy Sturgis notes that this historical consciousness meant both authors were, in a sense, exemplars of their age, men of remarkable insight and sensitivity who articulated the concerns of an entire era with unusual eloquence and urgency. Both Lovecraft and Tolkien were on a quest for something permanent, meaningful, and binding in a changing modern world. Simultaneously fascinated and alarmed by the technological advances they predicted would result in social, environmental, and cultural upheaval, Tolkien and Lovecraft both treat the hubris of man, or as it may be of hobbit or elf, as a critical threat in their fiction. Having posited the existence of unfathomable forces beyond the confines of normal life, they place their characters against vast backdrops of space and time, bringing them into contact with powerful and perilous creatures. Using the strategies we identified earlier, they create and sustain an atmosphere of eeriness which allows their readers to viscerally encounter the limitations of man's power and knowledge. Both authors show that the effects of breaching these barriers and coming into contact with the uncanny destabilizes their characters' prior assumptions about their world and themselves. In Lovecraft, this process tends to only work in one direction. His work defines normal, wholesome humanity as existing only inside a fragile bubble of ignorance. Any transgression, though it might indeed lead to greater knowledge, also leads to the corruption of the frail individuals who had dared to seek it, while those creatures and intelligences that exist beyond the bubble remain unaffected by the encounter. Indeed, their indifference is the very reason why many of these entities are so horrible. 
In Middle-earth, the boundaries between the natural and the supernatural are much more permeable. Mortals and mortal life are intimately connected with the fantastic. This connection creates a less one-sided relationship than that found in Lovecraft's fiction. Even the Valar sometimes find themselves mystified, impressed, or outright shocked by the deeds of elves and men. It's also not without its risks. Tolkien preferred to describe the beings and places that lie outside everyday experience as perilous. Yet rather than being viewed as a source of decay, this interconnectedness is more often celebrated as good and even necessary. Nature itself is often used to represent the risks of transcending ordinary life. In The Color Out of Space, the narrator's first sight of the woods west of Arkham forces him to take the rumors about it seriously. It was morning when I saw it, but shadow lurked always there. The trees grew too thickly, and their trunks were too big for any healthy New England wood. There was too much silence in the dim alleys between them, and the floor was too soft with the dank moss and mattings of infinite years of decay. Tolkien likewise often describes sinister, dangerous forests often corrupted by an outside evil. However, his portrayal of such woods isn't always entirely negative. In the Old Forest, the hobbits eventually come to realize that the forest and its inhabitants, in all their strangeness, have existed longer than they have, and that they are the foreign presence. Through meeting Tom Bombadil, they even glimpse the possibility of peaceful coexistence with a landscape that they previously found irredeemably hostile. Another source of connection with the otherworldly is in the character's own ancestry. Again, for Lovecraft, this is nearly always presented as a source of decay, to a degree that blows right past unfortunate implications and straight into deeply problematic territory. While there are certainly aspects of Tolkien's approach to lineage and heredity that readers should approach critically, he's much more likely to frame the mingling of different lines as a good thing, as it gives rise to powerful, noble heroes who achieve great feats in their own lives and provide a source of renewal to future generations. Compare, for example, the inhabitants of Innsmouth with the Dúnedain. The Dúnedain are descended from the Númenóreans, with some able to claim kinship with elves and even Amaya. The inhabitants of Innsmouth, on the other hand, are hybrids between humans and the fishy Deep Ones. Both are somewhat isolated and secretive groups with a characteristic appearance and strange skills or powers, mistrusted by the inhabitants of the mundane world. However, the Dúnedain are portrayed as wise and noble, bearing within their very genome a trace of the vanished glory of the Elder Days. The Innsmouth crowd, on the other hand, inspires madness and horror in those who witness their true nature. Luthien Tenuviel and the Waitley boys from the Dunwich Horror can all be described as the offspring of one terrestrial and one unearthly parent. However, Luthien is a beautiful, courageous, and noble heroine, whose descendants include some of the fairest and most powerful individuals among elves and men alike. Wilbur Waitley is a reeking, goat-like abomination actively working toward the extermination of terrestrial life, and his twin brother is even worse. So while contact with the otherworldly and the humbling of mortal hubris almost always results in horror and repulsion in Lovecraft, for Tolkien it's also often a source of wonder and bittersweet joy, a difference that's due to the two men's different philosophies. Lovecraft didn't invoke the colossal indifference of the universe merely for the sake of chilling stories. He developed a philosophy known as Cosmicism, which holds that there is ultimately no supreme purpose underlying existence, and views humans as having next to no power to affect how history unfolds, particularly when compared to the inexorable, incomprehensible forces he personified with his great old ones and elder things. Tolkien's perspective was obviously opposed to this. Both his Catholic faith and his personal experiences led Tolkien to place a high value on free will, transcendent morality, and the presence of a rational, organizing purpose to the universe. His fiction reflects this, including not only terror and grief, but beauty and hope. While Tolkien, like Lovecraft, warns of the futility and danger of seeking to command the forces of nature itself, he also affirms the surprising power of small choices made by ordinary people. Tolkien's fiction is, therefore, rightly considered fundamentally more optimistic than Lovecraft's. But does that optimism categorically exclude Middle-earth from a consideration of cosmic horror? I'm actually not so sure that it does. A lot depends on how you define cosmic horror itself. While the term often calls to mind tropes like gelatinous old gods, secret cults, and mental breakdowns, the real hallmark of cosmic horror is a feeling of dread that arises from a revelation about mankind's place in existence. For Lovecraft and many of the authors who consciously follow in his footsteps, this revelation is almost invariably man's insignificance in an incomprehensible, meaningless universe. But seeking to comprehend a world like Tolkien's, a world that assumes significance and redemption as basic truths, 
can sometimes also prove disastrous. After all, for all its beauty and wonder, The Lord of the Rings is far from a light read. While his philosophy imbued both his work and his life with hope, Tolkien also struggled with a grim awareness of suffering and darkness that at times verged on despair. From the mysterious fates, curses, and dooms that suffuse the Silmarillion, to the chance meetings in The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien depicts a world at the mercy of forces beyond human comprehension. At different points throughout The Lord of the Rings, the four Hobbit protagonists of the novel are all confronted with the knowledge that Middle-earth and its history are much bigger than any of them could imagine. When Frodo tells Gildor he never expected to face danger in our own Shire, Gildor replies, but it is not your own Shire. Others dwelt here before Hobbits were, and others will dwell here again when Hobbits are no more. The wide world is all about you, you can fence yourselves in, but you cannot forever fence it out. Much later, Pippin realizes that even Gandalf, who seems so familiar and harmless, is much more than he appears. By a sense other than sight, Pippin perceived that Gandalf had the greater power and the deeper wisdom, and a majesty that was veiled. What was Gandalf? In what far time and place did he come into the world, and when would he leave it? It's not just the sheltered hobbits who reckon with the limits of their knowledge. There also exist those things which are not fully understood even by the Valar themselves, from the nameless Nars beneath Moria to the mysteries of fate, free will, and death. Within this context, the revelation of one's significance in the greater scheme of things is often as much cause for dismay as the revelation of one's insignificance would be. Of course, there's the ever-present horror of being perceived by overtly malicious forces who, far from ignoring your very existence, are relentlessly searching for you to enact a revenge both deeply personal and deeply unpleasant. Describing the moment Sauron perceives him in the Palantir, Pippin says, Then suddenly he seemed to see me, and he laughed at me. It was cruel, it was like being stabbed with knives. Frodo witnesses this when he looks in Galadriel's mirror and sees the efforts of the Eye of Sauron to find him. Then the eye began to rove, searching this way and that, and Frodo knew with certainty and horror that among the many things that it sought, he himself was one. As he travels deeper into Mordor, Frodo becomes even more keenly aware of the presence of the eye, that horrible growing sense of a hostile will that strove with great power to pierce all shadows of cloud and earth and flesh, and to see you, to pin you under its deadly gaze, naked, immovable, so thin, so frail and thin the veils were become that still warded it off. It's quite understandable that one would wish to avoid being noticed by something like Sauron, However, another potent source of angst is the knowledge that one has been singled out to serve some greater purpose by ostensibly benevolent forces. Gandalf's attempt to encourage Frodo by pointing out his inheritance of the ring was intended by powers other than Sauron is often remembered. What's sometimes overlooked is that Frodo doesn't find this information encouraging at all. He objects, I am not made for perilous quests. I wish I had never seen the ring. Why did it come to me? Why was I chosen? Such questions cannot be answered, said Gandalf. You may be sure that it was not for any merit that others do not possess, not for power or wisdom at any rate, but you have been chosen, and you must therefore use such strength and heart and wits as you have. Even the characters who most vehemently affirm the ultimate triumph of good over evil and trust in the world's final redemption are rarely able to find much comfort in this knowledge. Captured and threatened by Morgoth, the great hero Hurin defiantly proclaims that the Dark One is not nearly as powerful as he claims to be. Before Arda you were, but others also, and you did not make it. Neither are you the most mighty, for you have spent your strength upon yourself and wasted it in your own emptiness. You are not the lord of men, and shall not be, though all Arda and Menel fall in your dominion. According to our best information, all of Hurin's claims are technically true, but whether it be through Morgoth's curse, the fallen state of mankind and of Arda itself, or the ineffable patterns of the great music, Hurin still witnesses the predictions of Morgoth coming painfully true for his family. It's not necessarily that Hurin's beliefs about reality were incorrect, it's that he failed to realize just how much suffering and degeneration those beliefs could encompass. This knowledge turns him from a proud hero to a bitter, broken man, and leads us to perhaps the most horrifying revelation of all, the knowledge that the redemptive actions of an ultimately benign power still don't negate the effects of evil. Describing Eru Iluvatar as the ultimate eldritch horror is usually played for laughs, but Tolkien was well aware that belief in a higher purpose did not preclude the possibility of personal despair. For proof, we need look no further than the fate of Frodo Baggins. 
A decent but ordinary hobbit, Frodo finds himself faced with a tremendous burden through what appears to be random chance, but what he is assured is in fact the product of some kind of will or intent. His offer to take the ring all the way into Mordor is described not as a moment of courage or empowerment, but surrender to an inevitable fate. A great dread fell on him, as if he was awaiting the pronouncement of some doom that he had long foreseen and vainly hoped might after all never be spoken. At last, with an effort he spoke, and wondered to hear his own words, as if some other will was using his small voice. Through Frodo's travels, his comfortable but limited understanding of the world is repeatedly challenged and transformed which, even under the best of circumstances, is never an easy process. And for Frodo, it involves being repeatedly pitted against terrors he never imagined. Worse, he comes to realize that even the most wondrous and sublime parts of the world are doomed to either pass away forever, or inevitably become evil themselves, falling prey to the corruption he bears, a force that is already at work in him. Exposed by turns to unfathomable horrors and heartrending beauty, the weight of responsibility grows, leaving Frodo only with the belief that the world is worth saving, which he must cling to against mounting evidence to the contrary. His compassion for humanity and appreciation of beauty are eroded by the insupportable weight of despair until he can't appreciate either. No taste of food, no feel of water, no sound of wind, no memory of tree or grass or flower, no image of moon or star are left to me. On top of that, he becomes increasingly aware that no matter how his little trip ends, it won't end well for him. This culminates when he accepts Gollum, a living embodiment of the degradation taking place inside him, as his guide through Mordor itself. Gollum is described in proper Lovecraftian terms as nightmarishly aquatic but still horribly familiar. His undeniable similarity to the hobbits and the flashes of his former personality make him sympathetic without lessening his grotesqueness. If anything, they make it worse, as Frodo and even Sam find themselves pitying and identifying with a depraved, wretched creature tormented by self-loathing. The seemingly hopeful climax of the book provides a Tolkienian eucatastrophe. Against all odds, evil is defeated, Frodo and Sam are saved. Deeds that appeared ineffectual at the time are shown to be meaningful after all. But though this is a better ending than anyone could have hoped for, it also holds more tragedy than anyone could have feared. In the midst of their victory, Frodo begins to realize the extent of the sacrifice it has required. Too alienated from ordinary life by his experiences to take up his old role as his friends are able to do, Frodo eventually understands his wounds will never fully heal on their own. No one can undo the damage that's been done, or stop the world's decay by reversing the flow of time. Ironically, it's only the power of the rings that could have done that. By taking the ship into the west, Frodo is given some hope of healing, but it's not something he can find among the very people and things he most loved, for whose sake he undertook the quest in the first place. Tolkien's fiction asks its characters and readers to affirm the goodness of the world despite the depths of its depravity. Viewed in a certain light, this has just as much potential to create haunting unease and horror as the meaningless more often associated with cosmic horror does. If Tolkien were entirely unaware of this effect, it's unlikely he would have chosen to end his novel by placing triumph alongside profound tragedy. So despite the many differences between the two authors, comparing Tolkien's work to Lovecraft's goes well beyond recognizing superficial tropes and devices. Both men provide opposing models for readers to conceive of the disruptive impacts of technological advancement and historical transformation. But while Tolkien's philosophy offers more hope for healing and redemption, it can't eliminate the dizzying horror of realizing the vastness and incomprehensibility of even a basically good universe. The acceptance of this experience gives both authors continued relevance and resonance, even decades after their death. If this video revealed truths that will forever haunt your dreams, hit the like button like it might bring you the sweet relief of oblivion. Subscribe to hear more instances of me mangling fictional languages. Thank you to everyone for watching, especially my cult members, I mean Patreon supporters. Including John H. Austin Jr., Gandalf the Grey, Marcel Ribeiro, Nick Riallo, Jeremy Buckingham, Bitso Bongo, Dorwin Gray, Brendan Mooney, Kevin Gilstadt, E. Rose B., Allison Kreutzberg, Frankie Twelvestring, Luke, Joel Bion, Rogue Hot Pocket, and Jared Carver. Until next time, avoid reading any strange inscriptions or gazing in any forbidden orbs.